Hello. So let's talk about the Great Society. <clears throat> what I think is Lyndon Johnson's bold initiative and arguably the boldest initiative of any American president, even more so than Roosevelt, for reasons I'll get to here in a minute. Now for Johnson, Lyndon had two goals. He wanted to end poverty and eliminate racial disparities. He sought relief for the most disadvantaged, in short. But these, again, are the two goals, poverty and eliminating these racial disparities. The motivation, some scholars look to Johnson's desire to prove that he was a strong president, to prove that he was good enough to follow Kennedy, that he was a legitimate leader. Others point to his own previous experience, his personal experience as a child with poverty, as well as his experiences as a school teacher when he saw many who were, again, denied what he believed was basic opportunity. Opportunity is the key word as we look at a great society and what this was all about. So let's get to this welfare state that he helps to create. Obviously, there are significant New Deal foundations and comparisons, somewhat obvious. I would go back further, though, to the progressive era. Progressives are the first ones who really argue that the federal government will provide solutions to our problems, that the federal government is the panacea <laughs> for all that troubles our country. So the progressives start that, and then you see it obviously in the New Deal with Franklin Roosevelt. You see a little bit with Truman and his fair deal. You see it a little bit with Kennedy during his time. But this is really the greatest legacy of progressivism is it expands the power of the federal government throughout the 20th century. But even beyond practice, it leads many Americans to believe that that is the salve to the problem, that, that the federal government is the answer. So again, these foundations, I think, go back to progressivism even. And like Roosevelt, Johnson sought what he called an economic bill of rights. Again, the fact that we all it should have the same opportunity for economic prosperity, equality, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a key difference here between Johnson and Roosevelt is that Johnson is doing this during a time of abundance, not during a time of scarcity. Roosevelt did it because he had to. We were in the throes of depression. Somebody needed to do something. Roosevelt took action, whether you believe he was successful or not. There is at least this recognition that he did something during a time of trouble. For Johnson, again, he's doing this during what are economically solid times. And to me, this shows a credible sincerity with regard to Johnson and his goals. He did not have to do anything about these problems. He did not have to take action, but he felt that it was important for the country and for our own progress. Now, what helped Johnson in many ways? Uh, there was a Democratic majority in both houses. So Johnson and the Democrats would win many of these programs quite easily. Additionally, with a century again that started with progressivism and later with Roosevelt and the New Deal and Truman and the Fair Deal and Kennedy and some of his actions, the American people had begun to realize or believe that federal intervention was the solution to problems. Another thing that Johnson had on his side was that he was an experienced legislator. He had been in Congress for decades. He knew whose hands to shake. He knew whose palms to grease, if you will. He knew how to get bills passed. This is something Kennedy did not enjoy as much as Johnson, and it is one reason why Kennedy had some issues getting through things passed through Congress. He didn't have that experience. He didn't have those connections. Johnson had them, and this greatly helped him and his Great Society programs. Now, this all kicks off January 8th, 1964, in his annual message to Congress in what would become known as the War on Poverty speech. Now, anybody who has taken one of my classes knows that I emphasize the study of history is about context. Look at the date, January 8th, 1964. This is a month and a half after John Kennedy has been assassinated. Johnson, in his speech, says, quote, Let this session of Congress be known as the session which did more for civil rights than the last hundred sessions combined, as the session which enacted the most far-reaching tax cuts of our time, as the session which declared all-out war on human poverty and unemployment in the United States, <clears throat> 
as the session which finally recognized the health needs of all our citizens. He says all of our older citizens, but he meant both. As the session which achieved the most effective, efficient foreign aid program ever, and as the session which helped to build more homes, more schools, more libraries, more hospitals than any single session of Congress in the history of our republic. Ambitious, right? And that's a lot of spending. But this was, again, Johnson's Great Society program, which starts with this war on poverty. The war on poverty is part of this Great Society program. Now, he speaks of many, quote, Americans who live on the outskirts of, outskirts of hope. Why? Due to poverty and race. They don't have hope. They don't have opportunity. Our task is to help replace their despair with opportunity. He sees the cause of poverty, quote, in our failure to give our fellow citizens a fair chance to develop their own capacities, in a lack of education and training, in a lack of medical care and housing, in a lack of decent communities in which to live and bring up their children. One significant thing that's going on here is that poverty is no longer seen as a failure of the individual. It is now part of a larger problem. It is society that is to blame. Now, this impacts the great society in significant ways. First of all, it's no longer considered a negative to be impoverished or to have to utilize welfare. What the administration is saying and what the American people are saying in general, increasingly, is that it's not your fault. On, you know, quite often things go beyond your own control. And so what the government will do then will use its resources to help you. This is not your fault. So getting past this, again, the two main problems he sees, and really the second is subsumed by the first, opportunity. There is a lack of opportunity. And involved in this, he sees a lack of training for people, especially the impoverished. They do not have the training they, that is necessary for them to find better jobs, find better employment, find careers, help their families prosper, etc. Specific recommendations. We have youth employment legislation. This is seen increasingly throughout the 1960s as a problem as youth is often idle, especially in the summer, especially at night. And this contributes to many of the riots that we see in the 60s. If we keep youth busy, and more importantly, if we give them these employment opportunities, they will learn a work ethic. They will learn how performing a job is important, and it will help them in the future. It also keeps them from being idle. He has the National Service Corps to help the economically handicapped in the United States. He seeks to modernize unemployment insurance. He wanted to extend minimum wage laws, provide more funding for education, hospital insurance for older citizens and the impoverished. He wanted to provide a housing and urban renewal program, and he wanted to reduce taxes doing all this. So again, this goes really across the board. He's trying to help all those who are disadvantaged, but he also seeks through this to also help the middle class in many ways. But make no mistake, the direct goal here, the direct impact is on those who suffer from poverty. Now, in many ways, this sounds familiar to us, right? Because these are many of the key planks really in any democratic platform since the 1960s. It is a consistent, uh, set of goals, really. Now, one other plus that we see that helps to facilitate some of this legislation going through is the recent assassination of Kennedy. There's a climate in Congress and throughout the country to get things done. There's some sympathy, but a general openness. They wanted to, again, kind of fulfill those goals that Kennedy had put forth, kind of continue and follow through with uh, the hopes, the optimism that came with Camelot. The four major planks, pretty much everything can be, again, put under these four. Civil rights, health insurance, unemployment and training, and education. Now, some of the myriad accomplishments. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 banned discrimination based on race and gender in employment. It ended segregation in public facilities and through this helped to desegregate education. This was a bill that Kennedy was supposed to sign. He was going to sign, but of course he was unable because he was assassinated. The Economic Opportunity Act of 1964 created an Office of Economic Opportunity. This was aimed at attacking the roots of American poverty. The Job Corps was established to provide vocational training for people. 
Head Start was a preschool program to help disadvantaged kids arrive at kindergarten ready to learn. One of the key things it did, it provided breakfast. This may seem kind of simple and we take it for granted, but if you are a poor child and you are going to school, it is difficult to learn if you are hungry. Now, this again is only part of the Head Start program, but this is also something that the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense will incorporate into their program later in the 60s in the Bay Area. Again, another accomplishment, VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America. This was a domestic Peace Corps, provided volunteer teachers in impoverished regions, federal funds to struggling communities to attack unemployment and illiteracy. The 1965 Voting Rights Act banned literacy tests and other discriminatory methods to deny suffrage. We've talked about Plessy versus Ferguson really opens up legalized segregation in many ways, but it also empowered the states. And so many of these states in the South would find ways to get around the amendment, the 15th Amendment, that said, hey, the right to vote, right? So with this, again, this Voting Rights Act gets rid of those possible ways to prevent the vote. Uh, again, facilitates African Americans to be able to vote and contribute and follow through with the promise of this legacy. Medicare, woo, offsets the cost of health care for elderly. This is significant. And of course, on the other side, Medicaid for impoverished people who cannot afford health insurance. The Immigration Act ended discriminatory quotas that were based on ethnic origins. This had been in place for decades and had, again, marginalized many populations from being able to migrate to the United States. The Omnibus Housing Act provided funds to construct low-income housing, and there was establishment of a permanent food stamp program. Now, Johnson succeeds in many ways. These are some examples, particularly early on. But in 1965, this all changes when he increases involvement in Vietnam with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Another example of the Cold War and, concomitantly, anti-communism affecting us in ways that it should not. It's affected us and caused us to make some rather bad decisions, right? Consider the social unrest in the 1920s that was fostered by this sense of, oh, for example, the race riot in Chicago, 1919. Oh, these African-Americans who are denied opportunity, they must be communists, right? And it leads to other, again, actions against people who aren't even really communists, even in the 1920s. Think about the appeasement of Hitler. Europe needed a buffer zone between them and those communist Soviets. That led to World War II. And of course, you've got McCarthyism in the 1950s. Now, what's significant here again, Johnson promised both guns and butter. He said he could fund war and domestic reform, all while cutting taxes. But again, in the big picture, there's simply not enough money. Significant funds would be redirected from his war on poverty and great society programs to prosecute the war in Vietnam. So, again, prior, in 1964 and early 1965, funds are going out to these programs. And they're, again, starting to work well. After this time, the funding is just simply not there. There's not enough funding. There is some funding going to them. But again, most of this has to go to the war. And in the big picture, I view this as a, an unfortunate irony for Johnson, the liberal Democrat president. He tackled issues that others had not. Civil rights. Think back, the progressives, they didn't address civil rights. Franklin Roosevelt, great president. He didn't address civil rights. He was worried about an economic depression. Johnson addresses civil rights. He was willing to dedicate his presidency to two significant parts of society that Democrats had always claimed to help, the impoverished and African Americans. He wanted to leave his legacy in that basket. And if you think about it, with Vietnam, without Vietnam, Johnson is probably considered one of the great Democrat presidents in our, in our history. But the conflict in Vietnam was not one he could ignore. And again, this is part of the Cold War. If he had gone soft on Vietnam or not gone over the, there to help, then he would have been criticized just like Truman for losing China. Well, Truman can't lose China just like we can't lose Vietnam. But again, for Johnson... He would not only continue the policy of involvement in Vietnam, and it had been there, right, for well over a decade, but he escalated our efforts there. And in the end, what is Johnson known for? He's known for Vietnam. He's not known for the Great Society. I have spoken with 
liberal Democrats from the era of 1968 who were in college, voting age, and they were absolutely thrilled when Johnson removed himself from the presidential race that year, which I think is kind of strange. But again, it shows that there's not this focus on what Johnson wanted to do or even part of what he did, but it's on Vietnam. Like we, many people just cannot escape that. So even though he did these bold initiatives that really helped, you know, people who were in dire situations, this is ignored. His efforts at the domestic reform are ignored all because of Vietnam. I honestly feel for Johnson. He wasn't a good guy by any stretch. There are many interesting stories that I won't get into here. Uh, YouTube would probably censor me. <laughs> but I think we can say that he was well-meaning. He meant well. He was sincere in his efforts. He was very much the ideal Democrat president if we take Vietnam out of the question. And again, I think this is a sad state for Johnson. I actually have a bust of Johnson in my office. And those who know me, again, know that I'm politically... I lean to the conservative side, but I have a great respect for Johnson for what he tried to do and the sincerity of, of his efforts. Now, what do we say? How do we conclude about this great society? Let's look at what a few historians have said. Some are of the more liberal bent. Some of are of the more conservative bent. Um, and some do recognize both strengths and weaknesses. Again, the big problem with American historiography is it's politicized. American historians today, many are liberal, few, very few are conservative, but they look at things through the eyes of being a political liberal, and that is unfortunate, and I think it's what really holds American historiography back. You can recognize the good and the bad of all. Nobody's all good, nobody's all bad. Well, almost nobody is all good or all bad, right? But let's get to some scholars and their takes on this. James Patterson recognized the Great Society did help many unrepresented, underrepresented groups, but also argues that a strong economy during this time did as much to help society as any of this legislation. Patterson also argues that the very nature of the Democrat Party at the time helped to stymie some of this potential success. For example, at this and during this era, Democrats were very much tied in with a variety of special interest groups. And many of these groups, while they wanted some change, they didn't want their industries to be affected as much. For example, healthcare legislation was somewhat limited because they had to support the American Medical Association, which supported them. So some of these items, even though you have Medicare and Medicaid, which are very good programs, especially in theory, we do see some of this legislation which would benefit hospitals, physicians, insurance companies more than the poor. Uh, later, during Nixon's administration, we will have the HMO Act, which completely changes health care insurance. Again, the idea to help people, but in the long run, it is very problematic. Other areas, for example, connections with organized labor prevented larger actions of large-scale public employment programs such as the WPA. So, Again, even though there is considerable success, just as in any American political situation, you kind of have to tiptoe that line and make sure both sides are somewhat happy, or at least you don't alienate your key constituencies. Maurice Iserman and Michael Kazin, authors of America Divided, the Civil War of the 1960s, which is an excellent work, not as good as Alan Matusso's, but it is a very good work. Iserman and Kazin, were activists during the 60s. They were very much involved in a lot of the stuff that went on. So in some ways you have a little bit of bias, but I do think they are very good historians. And as you can see from the title of their work, they're saying that the 1960s was the second civil war. And if you've taken the civil war class with me, you know that reconstruction failed and very much many of the antebellum practices would carry over to the postbellum practices. And African-Americans were denied opportunity, economic opportunity, denied the vote, segregated, et cetera, et cetera. So many of the problems that Reconstruction should have solved, it would take the 1960s and what they call the Second Civil War to actually rectify them. And I think this is a pretty strong argument in many ways. But Iserman and Kazin argue that uh, they claim that there were successes and the Great Society brought hope to many, but ultimately it failed because of a lack of dedication or spending. And again, this results primarily from Vietnam. They point out 
and demonstrate with specific examples that in 1964 and 1965, there was a lot of action. Johnson was determined. After 65, again, he promised guns and butter, but he could not deliver on the latter because of the former. They also point to the backlash of local governments who were not keen on the feds coming in and directing everything. And in some cases, they weren't keen on the actual people this was supposed to help being in control. Chicago Mayor Richard Daley is a perfect example of this. Uh, the Model Cities Act is, is one of the examples of the legislation um, that these authors include. Is it directed power to big city mayors rather than the poor who it was supposed to help? And again, Daley is a perfect example of this. He didn't think the poor could handle this. They shouldn't be in charge of these programs. I should be in charge of these programs. I know what's best for them. And of course, Daley was corrupt up to his eyeballs. And uh, the convention, the Democratic convention in 68, really exposes how big of a jerk he was. And I'm being kind with that term. In the bigger picture, this also affected traditional Democrat constituencies. Limited gains led to some disillusionment. Why isn't there more? Why isn't there more progress? A focus on welfare, for some, undermined the work ethic the middle-class Americans had considered necessary and a core aspect of American labor. New theories about crime and criminals contrasted traditional views and led many to believe law and order had been abandoned. Similar to uh, the questions about poverty and the fact that there's a belief that people are no longer, it's not their fault that they're impoverished, and for many it's not, right? This kind of carries over into new views on crime that sociologists have perpetuated, and that's this idea, again, that criminal, it's not their fault that they're criminals. It's not their fault that they have uh, performed acts of illegality. So because of that, Rather than punish them, we need to find ways to help them. And for some who are suffering from this crime, this is an abandonment of law and order. They felt betrayed. And what these two authors show, these are only a few of the examples that they go into at length, but they show that the, they reflect the traditional Democrat constituencies felt betrayed and eventually would vote Republican. This is the silent majority or part of that silent majority that Nixon would talk about. And these are the same people when we get to 1980 that will go and vote for Reagan as well because they felt that Carter had abandoned them. Liberals were now seen by many as limousine liberals. They were worried about the elites, whereas Republicans focused on the middle class, those who made up the majority of society. It's a little bit of irony in there, right? Now, two of the more liberal historians who point pretty much solely to the successes of the Great Society are G.S. Leviton and Taggart. These were social scientists, again, very pro-Great Society, and they supported the Great Society. They would use statistical analysis to show that it had made a positive impact. Hunger was alleviated because of an increase in the use of food stamps, for example. People enjoyed longer lifespans and had a higher quality of life due to Medicaid and Medicare. Medicaid alone would serve 23 million in 1974, and that was, again, just created a mere decade earlier. Increases in Social Security income led to a significant decline in the poverty rates of the elderly. Overall, 21% of the population suffered from poverty in 1959, only 12% 10 years later. So these, again, are only a handful of the statistics that these social scientists used to show that Great Society was successful. Now, there's an old saying, you have three types of lies, right? Lies, damn lies, and statistics. And sometimes statistics can be presented in a way that makes them look successful when maybe they really are. I'm not saying that's what Leviton and Taggart do here. I do think that there is a little bit of fudging, and this goes on both sides of the political aisle, right? They will take a certain statistic and make it look one way when it might actually be the other. And we're going to get to one example here in a little bit. But it shows, again, that sometimes quantitative analysis is not the sole arbiter of truth. Sometimes qualitative analysis is due as well. But even so, when you look at these numbers, just the number of those who were impoverished falling 9 to 10% in a decade is quite significant. It didn't eliminate poverty overall, and to be sure, you can't. I mean, there's been poverty in every civilization ever, right? But this bold initiative helped a heck of a lot of people. And when you're looking at 10% of the population, roughly, that's success in many ways. A final historian who we will look at is Charles Murray and his work, Losing Ground, American Social Policy, 1950 to 1980. You see where this is going, losing ground. Murray is a conservative historian who 
quite biased, looks at one side of it, right? Now, I think he makes some good points about some of the weaknesses or failures of the great society, but at the same time, he's blind to some of the successes. He argued that welfare only increased poverty and ultimately dependence on the government. Welfare policy he focuses on, which switched from, again, ending the dole to the institution of permanent income transfers, no longer just the deserving poor, it was now the involuntarily unemployed, the helpless. Many of the undeserving were also taking advantage, Murray argues. So this gets again back to that previous, you know, the, the growing sociological theory that poverty is not, well, people who are impoverished shouldn't be blamed for their poverty. And in many cases, again, you have some who are unemployed, maybe they're injured on the job, they're helpless in other ways, and this, their poverty goes beyond their abilities, right, or their control. But what Murray focuses, or at least shows, is that there were some undeserving taking, adva taking advantage of this as well. Significantly, many in the administration, again, no longer made a distinction between the two. And this is natural, right? If you have this type of outlay system, some people are going to take advantage of it no matter what. No matter how well they're doing, no matter what their political proclivities are, if they can take advantage of the state, they're going to do it. Regardless, the poor are being seen as victims now, again, rather than active participants in their own destiny. And Murray sees this as a problem and this being part of the reason that welfare might be perpetuated. With programs not working to help end poverty, many in the administration began to take a structural view of poverty, not just a temporary problem for some, but one which required a restructuring of society and the nation and that there would always be people who needed help Thus, in reality, there was no chance to truly end poverty. Again, this is something that Murray points to. Now, even the employed are given assistance, and this is one of the issues that he has. There are new in-kind transfer programs, such as food stamps, such as Medicaid, which were set in place and then expanded. So what Murray is saying is, look, you've got people who are able to work, people who are working, and we're still assisting them? Again, some may not be making enough money. You can look at this a couple different ways. That's Murray's argument, again, that now we're even helping those who are employed. He argues that the numbers are misleading, again, criticizing statistics. Other things impacted lower poverty. In 1968, for example, as programs barely had a chance to really take effect. One thing he points to, and this is a key issue, like when you look at unemployment rates, he focuses on labor force participation. And this is something that you should look at even in 2023 or whatever year you're in when you're watching this, hopefully. But he notes that there's a large decline in this, particularly among a certain part of the population. Between 1954 and 1965, for example, there is a reduction in labor force participation um, that was 17% greater. From 1965 through 1980, it was 227% greater. So what does this mean? It means that the those who are participate or those who are not participating are actually 227% higher than what that unemployment rate shows. So if it shows 4% of the population is unemployed, hey, that sounds great. But how many people are actually looking for jobs? So that only calculates those who actually are getting unemployment insurance, part of the system, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're not getting unemployment insurance and you're not in the system, and you're unemployed, it won't show that. So that's what labor force participation, I don't know if that was a very good explanation of it, but he sees this larger decrease in the actual labor force participation, specifically when these welfare programs hit. One area in particular, youth would especially drop out. And this is a problem because this is one of the areas in which the Great Society focused. And this was something that many people during the 1960s recognized that youth need to work in different ways. So this labor force participation declining significantly. And this is a problem. So you can look at the unemployment rate as one example, and it doesn't really tell the truth about what the unemployment situation is. He argues, quote, beginning in the mid-1960s, it was easier to get along without a job. It was easier to have a baby without being responsible for it, if you're a man, and without having to have a husband, if you're a woman, because you can just rely on the government. It was easier to get away with crime, thus it was easier to support a drug habit, and because it was easier to get along without a job, it was easier to get along without an education, so many simply did not participate. Again, this is how Murray concludes. I think he has some strong points in his analysis, but at the same time, he goes, again, he's overboard 
this historiographical problem where we politicize things rather than recognize some of the positives, he focuses almost solely on these negatives. So as we conclude with the Great Society, a few questions you may want to ask. First of all, was Johnson successful? Do these statistics tell the whole story and do they show that he was successful? Was he able to achieve what Kennedy might not have? What if Kennedy survives? Does he get much of this through? Does he even try? How do welfare state policies affect the long term? If we're trying to help people in the short term, does it affect them in the long term as well? How much credence do we give to arguments such as what Patterson puts forth or even some of what Murray says? Why do we see an increasing distrust in welfare programs? I would say one of the last questions to ask yourself, what is Lyndon Johnson's true legacy? Do we focus on his efforts in the great society, his efforts of helping those who were disadvantaged when he didn't have to? Or do we focus on his failure with Vietnam, something that was very much beyond his control, something that he did exacerbate to be sure, but something he was basically continuing a policy. And yes, he expanded our involvement in, in Vietnam. Some actually look at that as a good thing, most look at it as bad, but it definitely affected the great society and it definitely affected his legacy. And again, for that, I think it's somewhat unfortunate, but it's up to you. Was he successful? And what is his legacy? How do you view Lyndon?